Okay. Wow, this is a first. So Earl, who isn't here, just put a comment on the YouTube video saying my audio is not recording. Wow, he was right. So he turned my mic on. So no, no, that was just recorded. Sorry. So hopefully you're able to take good notes. Where is he? He's watching me putting comments. What the hell is this? Hi, Earl. How are you doing, my friend? Uh, that's new. OK. Damn millennials. So uh, <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, Google has this weird feature where now it automatically mutes it. And you have to unmute it. I don't know why it's doing that. That's, that's recent. But for those of you who are in attendance, Earl, right, those of you in attendance, <laughs> Did everyone get what I just said, right? You look at the you look at what the classification is. Okay, it's race. You look what the means are, you look what the ends are. The general rule of thumb is that a classification on the basis of race is unconstitutional. Remember what a per se nuisance is? Remember these from, from towards, right? It's almost per se unconstitutional. There's an expression that strict scrutiny is strict in theory, but fatal in fact. Strict in theory, but fatal in fact. That whenever you have any sort of racial classification, it's constitutional. Okay? Okay. Earl just replied, thank you. Okay, he's... <laughs> Whoever he is. So, he's not there. So, um, this much you should get, none of this is new. The reason why Grutter was perhaps so difficult to reconcile, putting aside the policy debates of affirmative action, is it didn't fit with this framework, right? Racial classifications were historically never upheld, whether they were for benign uses or harmful uses. And Grutter, um, one way or another, managed to fit it in. Is or are the benefits that flow from diversity compelling in the same sense of national security? No. I mean, maybe you can make the argument, but you'd have to redefine what compelling means. Uh, but in any event, the, uh, Justice O'Connor uh, voted the way she did, and it was upheld. Yeah, yes, sir. Presumptively unconstitutional. A classification on the base of race cannot stand. And I think this is based on an important policy <laughs> decision, right? The, when you're classifying based on race, we're talking here about skin color, okay? Does the government ever have a good reason why they want to differently, right? Are there any sort of innate differences between people who are white, black, or Asian? The answer is no, right? There are no innate differences between people of different races. Despite what white supremacists may preach, there are. We're all the same under the hood, right? Everything, the same chromosomes, the same DNA, you know, same organs, right? Same blood type. Everything under the hood is exactly the same. I mean, that's like you look different, but everything in the inside is the same. Fine. But what about other sorts of classifications, right? And that's what leads us into the discussion for today. So historically, starting with Brown and moving forward, they have what's called a two-tier approach. And this was referenced in one of the cases today, right? If you had a classification on the basis of race, it was strict scrutiny. Okay. But what if the government classified on the basis of age? Right? I'll give you a very easy example. Um, in Texas, how old do you have to get a driver's license? I don't even know. 17? 16, right? 16. In New York, I think it was 17, whatever it was. It varies by state. Uh, where was it up to? You, Yvette? Okay. Yvette. If the state passes a law saying that 17-year-olds can get driver's license and not 16-year-olds, is that discriminating against 16-year-olds? Well, let's make it easier. Let's say, let's say the law was 17-year-olds in Texas can get a driver's license, and they decide to change it, saying all these young millennials are being reckless, right? 18-year-olds, if you're 18 to get your driver's license, right? And you were like, you were like on your 17th birthday, you just got it, and they just changed this law on your 17th birthday. Is the state, is the state discriminating against you based on your age? Yeah. Yeah, they are. Okay? So that you go right to federal court, right? And you sue and you sue, sue, sue the DMV and say, give me my damn driver's license, right? Does that work? 
why why should the state be able to distinguish and in fact discriminate between 17 year old drivers and 18 year old drivers oh now you're talking my language right can the government come up with a good reason why 17 year olds can't drive and 18 year olds can do you think the government can come up with a decent reason why And what will these statistics show? Yeah. And would anyone, and if any of kids of this age maybe can speak up, would anyone have a problem with saying that 17-year-olds can't drive but 18-year-olds can? That seemed like a you know a sensible decision. Many states have it. Okay? So when you make a classification the base of age, uh, Yvette said the right word, the scrutiny is what's called a rational basis. Okay? What does that mean? As so long as a government has some sort of basis on which to rule, it doesn't have to be reasonable. It doesn't have to be logical. So let's frame this like this. The action must be rationally related, these are means, to a legitimate governmental interest. These are ends. The action must be rationally related legitimate governmental interest okay what does that mean so long as what the government is doing is not part of the phrase batshit crazy right and I, I use that so slightly as long as it's not batshit crazy the government can do it Based of age is under the give extreme deference to the legislative branch. Okay, under the rational basis test, the government always wins. In like ninety nine percent of the cases, when the rational basis test applies, the government wins. Indeed, there's not much of an exercise in judicial analysis. So once you determine that the classification is age, for example, or it be called a Race is a suspect classification because you're suspicious. Race is suspect. Age is non-suspect class. When you have a non-suspect classification, the rational basis test applies, and basically government wins. Everyone with me so far? Your hand up? Do I see a hand? Okay. So for almost like 30 years, we were in this weird situation where the government classifies something based on race, well, we want to strict scrutiny. That means the government loses. If they classify on the basis of anything else, age, for example, the government wins. So, Aaron, let me ask you this question. What if the government, the government determines that, well, you know what? When girls are 17, they can get their licenses. But when boys want to get their licenses, they have to be 18. And there are reams of evidence, which are probably accurate, showing that girls are safe for drivers, especially teenage girls. And there are reams of evidence showing that boys are 18, that 7 year old boys are a bunch of idiots and they can't drive and they get into accidents. They do dumb stuff. Yeah. Is there a difference, Aaron, between saying that 17-year-olds can get licenses and 18-year-olds can versus making it based on gender? Yes. What's the difference? And don't answer scrutiny. Okay, well, now it's kind of quasi-suspect. Uh, don't, don't tell me things like, what's the difference between excluding people on the basis of age and excluding people on the basis of gender? What's the difference? You are dividing the sexes. Okay. Instead of maybe making a stepping stone into something. What if the state determines that women teenagers, and this is probably accurate, tend to have far fewer accidents than male teenagers? And it's backed up by reams of evidence, binders and binders of evidence. Then it would still, it would still have to go to the legitimate I'm not, don't talk about scrutiny yet. Not, is there a difference? All right, I'll go with Johnny. Johnny, is there ever a legitimate basis for treating men and women differently by the government? Never. <laughs> John, you're on, you're on, you're on pause. Aaron. 
<laughs> so yes, there is legitimate reason. Why? So there, because anatomically, there's just different. We are just different. So for instance, we can- What did Daryl say? So for example, like um, abortion laws would not apply to a male because we can't have children. So there, would, there is a reason that you would distinguish between Okay, so this is a point that I want to raise, and Justice Ginsburg makes it in her dissent, right? And this is also the Craig v. Boring issue. There are a lot of uh, uh, purported differences between men and women that may be based on stereotypes or various characterizations. You know, men are stronger, you know, women are weaker. Uh, uh, men are working, women are home, right? A lot of these um, stereotypes are based on generalizations which, which frankly aren't true, right? But the fact of the matter is there are anatomical differences, right, between men and women. Um, uh, no men are able to naturally reproduce, and, and most women are. Not all, but, but most. So the question is, in what circumstances can the government take consideration of differences based on gender when passing laws? So we'll get to the intermediate scrutiny case in a few minutes, but the general gist is the... Um, Classification must relate to those sorts of anatomical differences. What the court has held is when you classify on the basis of gender, you cannot do so based on various stereotypes that men are stronger, women are stronger, you know, men are weak or whatever, right? That's actually based on some sort of difference. Okay? I'm going to avoid putting in the intermediate scrutiny here. I'm deliberately avoiding that because I want to build up to it because it's, it's a little bit more involved without developed. But until the 1970s, gender discrimination was considered a rational basis review. And uh, if the government did it, they basically were allowed to. And it was only in the 1970s you had a series of cases where the court reversed that. And that starts with the, the Boren case before that. But everyone get the general frame of how constitutional law existed before the 60s, right? If it was race, it went to the suspect class. Everything else is rational basis. Everyone get with me so far. All right. Can I go on? All right. So the first case we're doing today goes back to race. And uh, I probably should have done it in the last class, but you had enough reading, so I didn't burden you with it. So I put it here. And it's a case called um, Loving versus Virginia. Um, and I think I mentioned this, but... Uh, a very deliberate effort by the NAACP and others was to find case names that were very memorable, right? Brown, we bored, memorable case name. This one, Loving, right? How, how beautiful of a name is that a case for this situation? I mean, it's, it's almost like too good to be true. And there was actually, a, and, and, um, what was it? One of the same-sex marriage cases from Tennessee, one of the couple's last name was Loves, but instead we have a Burgerful which is a, a mouthful. So instead of having Loves versus uh, Haslam, we have a Burgerful versus Hodges. So unfortunately, you have to remember that case name. So a bunch of pictures. They want to see there's a documentary on HBO about a year or two ago about the Lovings. You, you watch this? Mm -hmm. Anyone else see it? I didn't watch it, but you have to, was it good? Yes. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to watch it. I, I don't think I even had, I don't think I even had HBO, but I, I got some screenshots from it at least. Um, uh, and so this is, this is Mildred um, uh, Dolores Loving and uh, her husband, Richard Terry Loving. Um, they had three kids, Donald, Peggy, and Sydney. Uh, and here are a series of pictures of them uh, to describe you know, who these people were. There's just one picture of them with their kids in the, I wanna find, there it is, yeah. There's this one picture of their kids with them sitting on the, on the porch, which is a, a pretty, pretty, pretty powerful picture as well. Uh, let's see what else I got, I got more picture of them, yeah. You can just scroll through this later if you want. And he, oh, here's a, tra a trailer of the uh, of the couple of the of the video. So, um, okay, Johnny, I'll come back to you. Johnny, what was a law Virginia passed in 1924? Uh, the white flag, could not marry. Okay, it was called was it the, was the Racial Purity Act? I think <laughs> if I can remember the name, I think it's called yeah, the other rate. I'm sorry, the Racial Integrity Act. Of 1924. Um, I want you to flag that act and just make a note in your memory. Because in about a week, we'll do a case called Buck v. Bell, where Virginia basically enacted a law that allowed for the sterilization of so called imbeciles. 
The same law that allowed for the sterilization of imbeciles was passed with this Racial Integrity Act. They were the same law. Um, to give you a sense of how eugenicists and white supremacists in the early 20th century went hand in hand. Um, Hitler perfected eugenics, we started it. Uh, uh, and eugenics in the early 20th century were very distraught. But, uh, so Johnny, what, what exactly did this law do? Let, let's be precise here. Had this law operate. Or just prevented How did it prevent it? Did it just prevent it? What, what, what happened if a, what happens if a person, interracial couple, was married in a different state and came into Virginia? Well, their relationship wouldn't be recognized by the state. Oh, far more than that. What would happen to Criminal offense. Felony, right? This is not just a matter that Virginia would not license a state, I'm sorry, an interracial marriage. Right? This wasn't just that the state would not issue a license to a black and white person getting married. Right? This was actually a situation where if you were married outside of the state and you came to Virginia and held yourself out as a married couple, you would be arrested and jail time up to one to five years. Right? Now, um, uh, Nakwanda, let me ask this question. Did this law apply equally to blacks and whites? Well, they argued that it did because both uh, blacks and whites got the same yeah, okay. And this is this is the key point, right? Under the rule of Plessy versus Ferguson, which which at that point was no longer law, but was slowly being chipped away, so long as blacks and whites were treated <laughs> equally, equally good, or equally bad, right? It wasn't unconstitutional. And indeed there were actually other cases that were referenced where, you know, if a black and white person fornicated, <laughs> that, that means had sex, the punishment for the black person may be greater. The punishment for the white person. This is the same sexual uh, liaison. Okay, here the jail time was the same for Mildred and uh, and her husband. So what's interesting is that, is the is the state walks in. Listen, blacks and whites being punished equal, right? This is not a mistake, and I'll, I'll dwell on this point for a second. The uh, people who enacted this law viewed interracial marriage as basically degrading the bloodline. And they viewed whites who went to marry a black person as traitors of the race. So they had no problem punishing the white partner in a, in a, in a union in the same fashion as the black partner in the union. Um, this was done very, very deliberately to actually punish them. Okay? Uh, all right, so Amanda, walk me through the facts here. How did, how did this case get started? Okay. Well, well, before they got exiles, they got where did they get married? Where did they get married, Amanda? Were they allowed to get married in Virginia? Oh no, they probably weren't. So where do you think they got married? Where they get they get married in DC, right? Oh, okay. And they tried to come back. <laughs> they were married in DC and they came to Virginia. What happened when they got to Virginia? Um, they yeah. So they were married in DC. They moved to Virginia. They're indicted for a violation of uh, the phrase, you may have seen this phrase, but I don't know, it's called an anti-misogenation, -mis I, I always, wait, nah. I always, I always, I always misspelled this word, here it is, it's all check words. <laughs> an anti-misogenation law, misogenation literally means mixing of the races. So this was called an anti-misogenation law, and you may see this, this phrase um, about. So they were actually indicted for a felony between one and five years in jail for interracial marriage. Um, the trial court uh, didn't send them to jail. The trial court, as Amanda said, basically said, if you leave the state and don't come back for 25 years, you will avoid jail time. And the judge, and I want to read this because it's, I, you know, it's, it's hard to hear, 
But, you know, this was an actual judge sitting in a criminal court in Virginia, 19, was it 58? He said the, well, the, the, they were originally convicted in 58. So he said, the almighty God created the races white, black, yellow, Malay, and red. And he placed them on separate continents. And but for the interference with this arrangement, there will be no cause for such marriages. The fact that he separated the races shows that he did not intend the races to mix. Um, there's all sorts of things horribly, horribly wrong with judges about God. You know, you, you go top to bottom, but this was actually viewed um, as a majority position in Virginia at the time, and I'm sure he was well within the mainstream. Um, he didn't send them to jail. He thought he was probably giving them an act of benevolence to let them get the heck out of the state. Also, though, it sends a very strong message to other interracial couples who are not welcome in Virginia. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's the magic number for racial harmony. I don't know. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't connect that, but but sure, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so this happens in, in 1958. Again, three years after Brown, or, or a couple years after Brown. At some point, in the Lovings, they leave. They get the hell out of town. I don't blame them. Uh, I don't think they were welcome there. Um, but eventually, after a number of Supreme Court cases, they file a motion in state court to set aside their sentence. Right, saying that the sentence violated the Fourteenth Amendment, uh, the Virginia Courts of Appeals uphold the anti-miscegenation statute. Okay, so um, Sophia, what what arguments did the state advance to defend the constitutionality of this law? Okay. Good. <clears throat> yeah, so okay, so the two arguments were like this. First, the laws apply equally to blacks and whites, right? Mildred and her husband got the same punishment, 25 years. They were not being treated differently. The second argument will actually have some resonance with us later, but historically, issues of marriage were issues of the states. And the federal government, indeed, the federal constitution did not intercede in the police power of the states, which includes the licensure of marriages. Okay? So, uh, uh, Renee, based on what we discussed before, right, what's the constitutional framework? How, would, how do we go about analyzing this sort of law? Oh, my, no. No, 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 no. Why would we use rational basis? Why would it be strict scrutiny? No, why would what why do we start strict scrutiny? Why do we apply strict scrutiny? Yes, that's the important point. You ask yourself question number one <laughs> what is a classification? How is this law classifying people? If you go to the statute, it says if a black person marries a white person or a white person marries a black person, by the way, Asians are cool, right? <laughs> if an Asian person marries a black person, it's fine. Hispanic marries a white, fine. It's only black and white, right? So if a black person marries a white person, that is a classification basis of race, right? So we ask ourselves, Renee, what is the state's compelling interest in, in prohibiting uh, interracial marriage? What, what did Virginia say? What what did the what was the law designed to do? Exactly, and this is what the uh, Chief Justice Warren writes: the, the the stated interest of this law, right, is to promote white supremacy. Um, there's really no other way to look at it. There's no uh, uh, defense of this. This was meant to preserve the integrity of the races, white supremacy. Okay. Renee, is that a compelling state interest that the Constitution recognizes? No, of course not. Okay, uh, uh, this is not a compelling state interest. All right, so it doesn't matter how narrowly tailored this law is. It doesn't matter that it applies to whites and blacks equally. The simple fact of the matter is that the preservation of white integrity is not a sufficient 
compelling state interest to warrant a classification on the basis of race. Everyone understand that? No narrow tailoring will save this racial classification because the ends that they're trying to accomplish are so um, uh, hateful and inconsistent with our constitutional order. Okay. Any questions on the equal protection analysis? It's actually fairly short. I mean, the opinion itself doesn't have that much reasoning. I mean, the court's like, are you guys kidding me, right? Are you really defending this law on racial and on uh, white supremacy grounds? Get out of your scram. Go home. And so any question on the equal protection analysis, right? I mean, after Brown and its progeny, this one flows pretty easily. Okay. I want to focus for a moment on the due process analysis. Now, we haven't done due process yet. In fact, the next topic after we do equal protection is the liberty interest protected by the due process clause. And I want you to pay very close attention to this analysis, right? Because it'll, it'll, this will come back when we do gay marriage in a couple weeks. And it says that this law deprived the lovings of due process without law, right? What is the liberty interest at stake here? Okay. The court says that marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man. Wow, great. So marriage is a civil right of man. Um, and this was very often assailed as an argument to say that it was a constitutional right to marriage. But I want you to keep reading where it said after that. It said, marriage is one of the basic civil rights of man, fundamental to our very existence and survival. Why was marriage fundamental to our existence and survival? Want to take a guess? Procreation. Procreation. Yes. So in every instance where the court referred to marriage as civil right, it was the explicit context of procreation and not love. Okay? We'll come back to this when we do uh, uh, same-sex marriage in a couple weeks. Um, but, but this case does not provide an easy rule of decision for the gay marriage case, even though many people said, oh, what's the difference? Well, the court, in fact, recognized that the liberty interest of marriage was completely tied to the survival of the race, which requires um, procreation. Um, Black people, white people, have the same chromosomes. They can reproduce. Uh, it's, it's it's a wonder, but it happens. Yes, it's it's you know it's magic. The miracle of life. You will not be watching this class, but it does happen. Did everyone watch it in middle school or high school? You don't watch the miracle of life? Oh, I watched it in eighth grade. It's just you don't teach it. This is Texas. They don't. Oh, they teach they it, do. but we don't watch that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I grew up in New York, so maybe it was a little bit more he, uh, heathen. Or, anyway. <laughs> anyway, so th the outcome of this case, of course, is that the uh, marriage of um, Mildred and uh, 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 of Loving and her, and her wife uh, has to be recognized, um, and it cannot be criminalized. Okay? Uh, this is a straight-up application of strict scrutiny. No matter how narrowly you tailor the means, you're not going to get to the end of racial segregation, that you're, or white supremacy. You're not, you're not getting there. Any questions on that? There was a note case after I mentioned briefly called Johnson v. California. Um, and this one's actually kind of interesting. Um, California had an unofficial policy where any new prisoners who came in they would segregate them on the basis of race. And they said the rationale, the reason why they needed to segregate the, the prisoners was to avoid gang violence. And in case you don't know, in Los Angeles and other places, there are many, many, many dangerous gangs that are oriented around race. You have Bloods, you have the Crips, you have MS-13. I mean, there are some seriously dangerous groups uh, in that various uh, war. So the police said, okay, so let's keep people safe. Let's, let's at least for 60 days segregate them, right? And the court said that this was unconstitutional. You have a um, uh, you have a classification the basis of race. What is your end? Well, they want to keep the prison safe. Well, that seems you know that seems fair, right? But what are the means chosen to go there? Straight up racial classifications. And the court said, no, no, you have to be more narrowly tailored. How about you say race and if they have a history of gang membership, or race and you know that they have some sort of history of violence. You can't just straight up segregate people, even a, even a hostile place like a prison. 
Um, interestingly, it says that Justice Scalia and Thomas dissented, and they were basically saying you should be a little more flexible um, with this and allow race to be used for safety. Uh, so it's interesting uh, Thomas' <coughs> vote there as well. By the way, is that a bag of broccoli? Yes, it is. You can't bring that to this class. <laughs> no, I've actually stopped eating broccoli because of Obamacare. I can't even look at it. So, <laughs> I really can't. I was actually I was actually at the Harry Carey Steakhouse in Chicago. Uh, asparagus, okay. Funny you mention that. The original, <laughs> the original evil vegetable for Obamacare was actually asparagus. The first judge, Judge Vincent in Florida, originally asked about asparagus. But then it morphed into broccoli, broccoli somehow. But I was actually at Harry Carey Steakhouse, you know, Harry Carey, right? Uh, in Chicago uh, recently. And the guy was like, you want broccoli? Like, no, I don't need broccoli. He's like, why is Obamacare? I'm giving this dirty look. <laughs> anyway. It was actually cool, though. So at Harry Carey Steakhouse, or happy Back to the Future to everyone, they actually have a Back to the Future display because, you know, the Cubbies win it. They actually had a hoverboard from the movie in the Gray Sports Almanac in a little display case. And the owner of the Harry Carey's Grill put uh, $2,015 in the Cubbies to win it all. Uh, doesn't look like it's going to happen. <laughs> Does not. Unless, oh, the Yankees lost three zips, so maybe, maybe it will happen. So, all right. Any other questions on race discrimination? What's that? So why do you got to bring that up? <laughs> Are you a Cubbies fan? No, I'm a Yankees fan. As am I. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions about uh, race discrimination? All right, let's move on. So the next topic uh, about sex discrimination is an interesting history. Um, and, and let me give a little bit of a background for this as well. Um, when we're discussing the 14th Amendment, a lot of courts held very clearly that the purpose of the 14th Amendment was to remedy the problems of slavery, which was explicitly a racial issue, right? Blacks were slaves, whites were not. And throughout much of the 20th century, with various Jim Crow laws, um, every, every injustice that you can fathom was perpetrated on the basis of race, okay? But that doesn't mean that everyone else in society had equality and don't for, for, for a moment think so. You'll remember the case of Bradville v. Illinois, right? This is a case where the woman wants to become an attorney, right? And her husband was her apprentice, and you know she passed all the, all the tests and stuff. And then the Supreme Court, I, th I, think, uh, uh, I think it was Sandra or someone else who, who was very upset by this one, right? Had this entire discussion of how you know, the woman's place is in the home, and you know, she can't possibly be in law school, right? None of you girls can do this, right? And you know, there was a discussion about women don't have these rights, and you know, at that point, they were interpreting the Privileges or Immunities Clause. But if we look at the 14th Amendment, I forgot to put it up there, but just flip to your Constitution, it's on page uh, 26. If we look to the 14th Amendment, right, the language of the 14th Amendment is pretty broad. It says, nor shall any state deny to any person within its jurisdiction legal protection of the laws. Nor shall we say deny to any person, person, that means no robots, right, or animals, the protection of the laws. It doesn't say men. It doesn't say on the basis of race. It doesn't say on the basis of gender. It says no person shall be denied equal protection of the laws. So what do we do with that language, right? On the one hand, we have history, and the Civil War was fought over race, was fought over slavery. Reconstruction amendments were passed to give the freedmen equal protection. But the language of the 14th Amendment is much broader. So what happened in the 20th century was a very strategic legal campaign was waged. Um, uh, uh, you know... For today, as um, uh, you know, the notorious RBG, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, right? There's actually a book by that title being released next week by Irene Carmone, which uh, I, I pre-ordered a copy of. By the way, this is the greatest picture ever. It's Glee and Ginsburg riding an elephant. They went to India together on some trip, and they're riding an elephant together. These are actually the best of friends. It, it, it's a testament that people who don't agree can get along quite well. But yeah, this is Ginsburg on the back of the elephant, and Scalia riding up riding front. Um, so there was a very deliberate legal campaign waged by Justice Ginsburg and uh, people at the ACLU. 
And the purpose of this campaign was to highlight gender discrimination, but not in the way you think, not by showing that women were worse off than men. That would be counterproductive at this time. They wanted to find cases where men were being treated worse than women. So for example, Craig V. Bourne, right, the case we have here, <laughs> that the girls could start drinking this, this, this light beer before the boys could, right? Or another case called Reed v. Reed, right? This was a law, uh, this was a case where, um, I'm, I'm grossly summarizing, the, the state passed a law saying that in some sort of custody dispute, the man should be preferred. I'm sorry, the woman should be preferred. Or, I don't see which one was. Basically, the statute says one gender should be preferred in a custody dispute. And the court held there's no valid basis. Okay? Another case was mentioned in a book called Frontiero versus Richardson. The facts were like this. If you were a man in the Air Force and you had a wife, the wife would automatically be given a stipend, kind of like, a, like an allowance, right, uh, for being a spouse of a service member. Mm -hmm. What if you were a female service member and you had a husband? You need to first apply and persuade the government that this person was actually a dependent. Why? The presumption was if there's a man in the family, he can't be dependent because he's working. But if there's a woman in the family, well, by golly, then she's got to be the dependent because she can't possibly work. So Ginsburg brought this other case to the Supreme Court called Frontiero, where they said, no, you can't presumptively assume that the woman will be the dependent. The biggest case in this um, series was in 1976, Craig v. Bourne. And I actually have a picture. Uh, oops, where is it? This is actually a picture on the 20th anniversary of Craig v. Bourne. And this is the defense attorney arguing for Oklahoma. Um, and this is actually the owner, Carolyn Whittier, of the Honk and Holler <coughs> convenience store. So this is actually the, the store at issue in the case, the Honk and Holler convenience store. And the owner of the store actually brought a claim saying that she wanted to sell this cheap beer to men who were 18, but she couldn't. That was actually the case, that they were discriminating against men and that men could not buy the beer, which is an interesting way of bringing in this case. Okay. One, uh, actually, when I went to college for a semester in Oklahoma, and I was surprised to learn that all their beer is what the heck? I, I don't. I, what is this law called beer? What is it? Is it like. It's, it's any beer you bought with just a lower percentage alcohol. Even like Budweiser or anything? It was Budweiser. It was, it was Budweiser. It was just 3.2 instead of. Uh, they don't sell. What, what about like liquor? Is liquor the same? The li no, the liquor would be strong, but just the beer that you have <laughs> liquor. And they also, you couldn't get tattoos in Oklahoma either. You had to drive to Texas to get a tattoo. And is that still like that? That's changed since then. Any Okies here? I don't know. I've never been. <laughs> it's the same way on beer, though. It's like, it's like low volume. Yeah. Is it gross? <laughs> 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 All right. So, uh, what are they up to? Ah, Janine. Okay, Janine. What were the facts uh, in Craig Be Born, please? <laughs> um, so going off of what we've already said, there was um, discrimination against women Um, the girls could buy the beer, the boys couldn't. Yeah. Be a year older and um, close. You had to be 18 to be to, to be a female and 21 for a guy. Okay. okay, good. Yeah, I always forget numbers. Also, go ahead. So, what were the so what what happened with this law? Why? Um, supposedly, uh, boys can't handle their liquor as well as girls. <laughs> and, okay. I mean, they they had um, a higher percentage of. Okay, so you remember we did the case South Dakota v. Dole, right? And the entire nature of the case was, you know, did the state have an interest in, uh, uh, you know, making the, uh, the drinking age 21 or not, right? Um, here we have something different. The state determined that women are less likely to get into car accidents than men at the age of 18. So we can restrict the sale of this light beer to women at the age of 18 and for men at the age of 21. Okay? 
So this decision is authored by Justice Brennan. Um, Justice Brennan, I keep looking at that broccoli. Justice Brennan um, was famous. Thank you. I appreciate it. I can still see it, but I'll, I'll let go. Oh, much better, much better. Yeah. Justice Brennan was famous for being a very smart tactician. He was perhaps the greatest justice of the 20th century for pitching together five vote majorities. There was none better. He didn't care what the opinion said, so long as it reached the right results. He once asked his law clerks, how do we change the law? And they're like, I don't know. He went like this, five. Five votes is all you need to change the law. And he believed that emphatically. Um, I don't particularly like him, so I'm, I'm, being, I'm being charitable. But, but he firmly believed in the power of the courts to transform society. So what you have to remember is that before Craig v. Bourne, the word intermediate scrutiny didn't exist, right? The court had kind of suggested in previous cases that gender scrutiny was, you know, maybe higher than a rational basis, but they never actually said it. So we come to a point, and I'm going to finally fill in this blank space. Thank you, Taylor Swift. Here, where he mentions this, oh, Taylor, sorry, where he mentions this very subtly. And, you know, he mentions this sentence without even, without even giving it much thought. And let me write this out, okay? The classification by gender must serve important governmental objectives and must be substantially related to achievement of those objectives. When everyone was reading it, did anyone like highlight that and make that a big deal? When you're reading the opinion, he's like, oh, no big deal, right? That test was materialized from thin air. He made that up, and he didn't even bother explaining why. Okay? By doing this, he made clear that gender discrimination is not subject to scrutiny because the different test applies. But he also makes clear that it's not subject to the rational basis test, where basically the government wins. So he crafts this new test, right, for what are called quasi-suspect classes. It became known as intermediate scrutiny, right? It's somewhere in between. The idea is when you're classifying based on gender, you need to have not a compelling governmental interest, but important governmental interests. Uh, Andrew, what's the difference between compelling and important? So we have over here compelling, and here we have important. What's the difference between compelling and important, Andrew? Compelling, which is which? Compelling is. Okay, so you see this line scale, right? Strict scrutiny is based on a compelling interest. Like, this is a big deal. Important is still there, but not quite as high in the list. Okay? So you can see him saying, you can discriminate on the basis of gender, and you don't need quite a good of a reason, right? This is not Korematsu, where national security justifies discrimination based on gender. There's nothing compelling. It just has to be important, okay? But then, uh, Michelle, we have here, with rational basis, the expression that the action must be rationally related, okay? Right? The means have to be rationally related to the ends. Here we have now this test of substantially related. What's the difference between rationally related and substantially related? I don't think rational means the rational in the way we... Um, no, it means batshit crazy, right? And, and I, I say that lightly, but basically any conceivable 
link you can make is fine. What does substantially related mean? I think substantially means, again, more important. Who decides if the relationship is substantial? The courts. The courts. Okay. So with rational basis, so long as the link between what they're trying to do and how they do it is not that you're crazy, the courts will defer. But by putting this word substantially in there, the court can decide how close is the fit between the means and the ends. How close is the fit between the difference ages in beer and protecting highway safety? How close is that fit? Right? It doesn't have to be narrowly tailored, right, to use the language up here. It doesn't have to be perfectly narrowly tailored, right? It doesn't have to be a, you know, a, 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 a tight fit. But it's got to be a good fit between the means and the ends. Everyone get that. Stop me if you don't. This is an important point. Everyone understand how Justice Brennan borrowed the language from strict scrutiny by compelling <laughs> and made it important. And he borrowed the language from rational basis and changed rationally to substantially. He borrowed from one going down. He borrowed from one going up. And he fashioned this intermediate scrutiny test in one sentence that most people probably read right over and didn't even notice. Any questions on that? He was very crafty. He was diabolical even the way he did this. And you can see Justice Rehnquist, it sounds like, whoa, you guys, did you see what he just did? He just made that up out of thin air. And I was like, okay, cool, let's apply it now. <laughs> yes, sir. He's all, not only is he ruling that in this case, he's opening up the door for when they flip it back to women's cases. To of course. The ultimate goal of this, and I, I, I can't say it's clear enough, is about abortion, right? So I think, was it, was it Steve or someone who mentioned earlier that, or maybe it was Aaron, that women have laws that affect them concerning abortion and men don't, right? A, a law affecting abortion does not affect men. It cannot, or at least directly at least, right? Justice Ginsburg has maintained for nearly 40 years that the proper protection for abortion rights is a law discriminating against women. Not that it violates a right to abortion, which is somewhat nebulous, but it's actually for gender discrimination. Uh, that position has never maintained a majority in the court, but this is what they're building up to, right? They're not concerned about the poor men in Oklahoma who can't drink beer at 18. They are building the framework, to use your words, to flip it around, to get to the point where they will at one point uh, uh, have women who are being treated worse and bring these sorts of suits. But everyone get this framework, right? And what happened subsequent to this case is that these quasi-suspect platforms were not limited to sex. Things like illegitimacy, for example, right? If you're, pardon a phrase, a, a child of parents who are not married, a bastard child, which is a phrase we don't use anymore, right? At one point, laws actually disfavored bastard children that couldn't inherit property. I right, studied about this at some point. Uh, these laws were deemed unconstitutional. Okay. Why does it matter which tier of scrutiny are you in? Right? Why does any of this make a difference? The reason why it makes a difference is it often determines the outcome of the case. If you fall into the strict scrutiny box, the government loses. If you fall into the rational basis box, the government wins. Intermediate scrutiny means maybe yes, maybe no. Okay. Now. I'm going to give you a healthy dose of reality and say none of this matters anymore, right? Why? The same-sex marriage decision of Burgerfall, which you'll read soon, does not mention the word scrutiny. Not even mentioned. Justice Kennedy doesn't believe in scrutiny. It's too confining for him, okay? None of these amorphous standards can fit Justice Kennedy's ego. So what happened in that case is a law that discriminates on the basis of sexual orientation a violation of equal protection. We don't know, because Justice Kane didn't address that point. It violates rights of dignity and other stuff you'll read about. The Supreme Court has not looked at tiers of scrutiny in like almost 15 years, probably since Grutter, right? They don't really consider scrutiny for anything other than race. There has not been a new suspect class in a very long time. So I teach this to you with the full understanding that it probably doesn't really matter much anymore. Um, the tiers of scrutiny never really mattered much, but even after a burger poll, they matter even less. Um, for example, Lawrence v. Texas, which we'll study in a few weeks, uh, is a law that prohibits homosexual sodomy, uh, violation of equal protection. Uh, the Supreme Court didn't address that, and they said it was a liberty interest to engage in love and other things that Justice Kennedy likes to talk about. So equal protection law and scrutiny doesn't really matter anymore. 
Um, don't write that on the bar exam. Tell them what strict scrutiny is. Tell them what protection is. But in reality, after Burgerful, it doesn't matter. And if you're saying, what? Josh, what are you talking about? When we do a Burgerful, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, by the way, that case is 100 pages. Make sure you start reading it early. Um, it's a long case, but it's, it's worth the read. So make sure you start that one early when we get to it. I don't like assigned full cases, but for that one, you're going to read it. There's a lot of important stuff there. Okay. So let's look at how Justice Brennan goes through the analysis. Let's go back up. Cameron, um, what sort of evidence does the state provide to justify the legality of this action? Um, they're brought, uh, rest statistics. Yeah, yeah. What, what do these statistics say? That, uh, 18 to 20 year old male, they're more often than Okay. And what else? What other kind of evidence do they provide? That use 17 to 21 found to be overrepresented in the school. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay, good. So, so Cameron, thank you. So, effectively, they bring forward all this evidence saying how, you know, Men are more likely to be arrested for drunk driving. Men get into more accidents, et cetera, et cetera. Um, right. Is this evidence sufficient to persuade Justice Brennan that there's a substantial relationship, a, a fit between the age classification and the uh, goal of safety? Uh, no, because uh, it, only, it represented 0.18 of the females and 2% of all of the males. So Brennan feels like <clears throat> essentially making uh, this broad of a characterization based on 2% of individuals with the 98% suffering such severe harm is, is, is <laughs> good. So Brennan says like this, look, even if we take their statistics as accurate, the difference between men and women is so small that it's not substantial enough, right? There's not a substantial enough relationship between the classification and the basis of gender and the goals of keeping highway safety. Now, um, uh, Jerry, do we usually hold legislatures to statistical accuracy? When, when a member of a state house in Austin votes on something, do we ask them to say with statistical accuracy how many lives will this save? We don't really ask them. They usually do. Do we, do we throw them off as if they're not accurate? Not necessarily. Why not? Because it's usually worth one do we generally presume that when, when legislatures make findings, they're in good faith? Yeah. Does Justice Brennan think these findings are in good faith? I think so. Really? Do you think he, he thinks that this was actually a law based on trying to promote, promote safety? I think that the underlying, I mean, it, it's pretty obvious that that's what it was. No, I don't think. Nikolai, what do you think? Do you think Justice Brennan thinks these laws were actually passed based on strict statistical concerns about safety? No. What do you think motivated? Also, Justice Stevens. Just, we'll, we'll get to Stevens in a minute. What do you think Justice Brennan thinks motivated these sorts of laws? Yeah, I'm not sure about that. Uh, but I know that Justice Stevens doesn't believe that. that Good. The goal of the, the statute. What does Justice Stevens think the goal of the statute was? I don't know. I'm looking for it. <laughs> okay, uh, Jennifer. What What does Justice Brennan? Think that the real goal, it's in a footnote, so he makes this point very clearly, that the real goal of this sort of law was, or why this law was passed. Louder, I can't hear you. What was the real reason why men and women were treated differently in this sort of law? What do you mean stereotype? Yeah. So Brennan writes like this. This law is based on a stereotype that women are more mature than men. Whether that stereotype is true or not, laws cannot be passed based on negative stereotypes. He effectively says, listen, yes, men and women are anatomically different. And perhaps if you make a classification based on anatomical differences, we'll give it to you. But if your law is based on gender stereotypes that men are more mature than women or women are more mature than men, whatever it is, that violates the protection. And there's one footnote We actually says maybe the reason why women have fewer DUIs is that when a guy is pulled over for DUI, he gets arrested, and the girl is a chaperone home, a chauffeur at home. Yeah? I was going to say that you could have a darker reason that stereotype is a 
Oklahoma was a Native American sort of Native American state with all the reservations. It's well known that there were more Native American deaths due to alcohol related accidents and poisoning. And it's kind of it's kind of sad because I I don't know what the statistics are of the scientific proof of this, but the Native American reservations have a huge alcohol problem and the store was probably selling to Reservations. I suspect the state might have had that the stereotype. I think maybe referring to might be Native American reservation. I could be wrong. Maybe. But think about it. Maybe so. What we have here, though, is that Justice Brennan is being cynical. He does that very well. He's saying, "Listen, this law was not passed with highway safety. It was based on lingering stereotypes that men are are, are less responsible than women, and this you cannot do." So what's interesting about Justice Brennan's opinion, though, is how skeptical he is of the state's interest. This isn't a situation where the state walked in and offered no rationalization. They actually offered statistics. They offered things like, here, here's a good reason why we did this. This is why we passed this law. And Justice Brennan's like, no, BS. That's not the real reason. Okay? Even though he calls his intermediate scrutiny, <laughs> it sounds an awful lot like strict scrutiny. Even though he says the only need a substantial relationship between the means and the ends, he's looking for real narrow tailoring that you use the least restrictive means possible, right? That that you could not achieve highway safety any other way. Okay? The very sort of deference that's characterized by a rational basis, he gets rid of. And he's not at all deferential to the state. I mean, he's basically saying, well, point two here, point one there, it's not good enough. Legislatures are not required to perform with mathematical certainty. They simply don't. Okay. <coughs> and the process, and in footnote 14, says, oh, by the way, we have this new middle tier stuff here, right? We have this upper tier stuff, and now we have a middle tier stuff, right? That's not what we're doing today, but if you want to call it that, that's fine. He says, I'm not endorsing this characterization of middle tier, but yeah, if you want to call it middle tier, go for it. This is classic Brennan. He's like, I'm not doing it, but if that's how you want to read it, go for it, guys. That's all you, right? It's almost this weird sophistry that he was a he was a master at. I, I know I'm being tough on Brendan, but he was a a, a craftsman of the highest order. Can I ask what you dislike about Brendan? It'll be easier to ask what I like about him because it'll be a shorter <laughs> answer. I, uh, yeah. He was from New Jersey. I mean. You know. <laughs> I actually gave a talk at Rutgers a couple weeks ago, and there's actually a Justice William Brennan State Park across the street from uh, 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 the, the law school. It was in the shade, which I suppose is very appropriate. <laughs> so back to the uh, – <laughs> we'll do some more Brennan later. So in the very last sentence, right, in the very last sentence, you actually get to the holding. Brennan, he did this all the time. The very last sentence, you put a big star next, right? Okay. In fact, when it is further recognized that Oklahoma statute prohibits only selling a 3.2 beer to young males and out there drinking, okay, here comes the big part, quote, the relationship between gender and traffic safety becomes far too tenuous to satisfy Reed's requirement that the gender-based difference be substantially related to achievement of the statutory objective, okay? Reed said nothing about that. The test he just created two paragraphs earlier. So basically, he created a paragraph Sorry, he created a test in the first paragraph, and then the last sentence said, oh, we violate this test, which was really from the earlier case, which never mentioned it. But we have here, for gender-based classification, the fit is too tenuous, the fit is too weak. This is, this, is, this, is, this is trademark Brendan. I mean, no one did this better than him. All right, so any question about the majority opinion? We have this test, I mean, it can be framed different ways, but this is how he frames it, so I'll copy it. The ends must be important, and the means must be substantially related. That is now our standard for quasi-suspect classifications uh, uh, under equal protection. Any questions about justice uh, majority? Yes, sir. Well, it's, I mean, it's based off of uh, the dissent. So we'll, we'll get to the dissent in a couple minutes. Actually, you're up next. So what did Justice Powell say in his concurring opinion? Uh, Powell joined in the opinion, but felt that they didn't need to go through a, a this particular um, analysis. 
Um, Why? Why do you think he? And by the way, Powell was a moderate. He was a moderate from Virginia, a gentleman guy, very middle of the road. Why do you think Powell is uncomfortable with the majority opinion? Um, if I remember correctly, it's because he didn't feel that. Uh, I think it's because not enough deference was given to the state. Yeah. Basically, Powell says like this, like, look, this is an easy case, right? The state didn't have a good reason why they're treating men and women differently. But the test that you put forward is so non-deferential that in other cases where there may be a good reason to treat men and women differently, it won't suffice. So uh, let's see. Uh, all right. <laughs> Brian, let me ask this question. Give me an example of a governmental interest that's important that would justify treating men and women differently? Uh, the draft. Oh, that was mentioned in the case. Why is the draft, this is uh, what's called Rockster, Rockster versus Goldberg, or Rock, Rockster, I can't tell. Why, why would the state have a, have a, to use Justice Brennan's word, an important interest in excluding women from the draft, or not including women? Homeland, right? Is that is that an important government? Is is national security an important governmental interest? No doubt, right? Is excluding women a way to promote national security substantially? Could you improve national security with women without making this classification? And this, this is what you have to ask yourself, right? It's not to say that, yes, having men in the draft would promote it. Could you have the same sort of goal without excluding women? At that time, I don't think so. I don't think the mindset was there. Does the Constitution change what year it is? Well, there, what do you think? Does the state have a... Uh, uh, <coughs> is the exclusion of women from the draft, is that substantially related to achieving national security? In other words, could the government achieve national security absent the classification of basic gender? Yes. You good? For that reason, why do you continue? Mm. Well, let me give you a different question. And this is actually one very salient to Houston. Um, to, to Andrew. State segregated by gender bathrooms. Does a state have an interest in having men and women have separate bathrooms and showers and, you know, if it, let's say it's a public pool, so separate locker rooms. Yes. What's the state's interest in segregating the locker rooms on the basis of gender? You don't want uh, accidents to happen between what are these accidents you speak of? <laughs> well, rape, rape is a crime. That's not an accident. <laughs> right? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't just slip in, right? Usually these are deliberate acts. Right? I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm being very deliberate here, right? Oh, I'm being fired. <laughs> Privacy of whom? Privacy of, of, of every person. Ah, <laughs> it doesn't matter male or female. Everyone's kind of <coughs> certain that even an expectation of privacy in bathrooms. Okay, so uh, next up, uh, Clint. Let me ask this question. So you take a transgender person, right? Someone born biologically uh, uh, male, but identifies as a female, and this person says, "I am stigmatized by being forced to go to a uh, men's bathroom. I no longer want to go to a men's bathroom. I want to go to a women's bathroom. That's how I identify." And women in the bathroom say, I don't want a person with a penis in the bathroom. Does the state have a compelling enough interest to exclude the transgender person from going to the women's bathroom? I think they would. Why? Why? Answer it. I mean, this is on the ballot right now. You have to think about it. Why? Why would this person pose a risk to women? What about the transgender person poses a risk? Because they're 
not the same. I mean, uh, Iris, what do you think? Yeah, why is it a risk? Why would it be dangerous to allow a, a, a person who is born male and identifies as female to use a ladies' room or use a ladies' gym? <laughs> what's the what's what's the what's the concern there? I don't know. I don't want to sound like an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> I, I already I already <laughs> broke that wall for tonight. <laughs> you can go for it. <laughs> I guess I am thinking I, I have a little role to walk in on a guy who's and she and she sees his penis and she's asking why does he why does he have boobs and a penis? And I and then I stopped having his contact with her. Right. So I appreciate it. So I'll get to you in a second. So, but this is actually an issue, right? So I think I mentioned this a couple weeks ago. But I, was, I was waiting for this for this class to teach it. Um, Houston enacted a law, uh, Houston City Council enacted a law called the Houston Equal Rights Ordinance, or, or HERO, if you love acronyms, right? Um, I think all laws should be given numbers and not names that people can identify them as well, but I, I'm going to lose that one. So one of the – the law has many provisions, right? So among, among other things, it says you cannot discriminate against gays and lesbians in employment and various other things. But the provision that has been seized upon, and if you watch TV, you've seen commercials on nonstop, is the so-called bathroom provision. And the law basically says you have you cannot exclude a person from a bathroom on the basis of gender identity. What does that mean? The person was born biologically male and identifies as female, right? That person should use a female bathroom. Not a single stall, but the bathroom reserved for females. And if you watch TV, if you listen to the radio, if you if you Listen to Lance Berkman. Um, there are commercials nonstop saying that we don't want, you know, these uh, uh, sex offender. The most recent one is there was a a transgender sex offender, and we don't want this person entering into a bathroom to be predatory on children. Okay, so I'm going to just devil's advocate for for a moment, right? Why do we presume that a person who's transgender will be a pet will be a predator? Is there any evidence that transgender people are predators? Do we need this evidence? Uh, I'll get to it in a second. So, you know, I'm playing a little devil's advocate, but partially. One of the points that Justice Brennan makes is that when you make classification the basis of gender, they can't be based on stereotypes. And indeed, I, and I'm, not, I'm not calling you an asshole, but, but indeed there is a stereotype that, that, that a, uh, a person will basically um, disguise his identity for the purpose of being a predator and stumbling into the bathroom, right? Is this based on irrational animus, or is this based on prejudice, or is it based on, well, I don't care if it's a stereotype, I want my, my little girl not to see a penis. Well, I... I, I, Please, I I'm, I'm, not, not, I'm not pointing out, but you were next in the lineup. I'm not saying that they're, uh, they're going to be a predator. I just, I, I want to be engaged in giving the chance to explain that to her when I feel it's appropriate, mm. but, uh, I, you know, whether or not I agree with it. It's right. their choice. And so when I send my daughter to the bathroom, I don't want to be worried that I'm going to have to have that conversation with her while we're having dinner. Uh, right. I, I don't think that's automatically they're going to go after her. Right. So and so it's the other issue, and this is one to think about, is there's also the stigma of the person being turned away from the bathroom if his or her choice, and whether that's a cost that society should entertain. So you actually have a choice. I hope all of you vote. Um, uh, I don't care what you vote in this ballot one way or the other. But the ballot on this initiative is to either vote yes is to maintain it, vote no is to repeal it. And I actually I did a, I did a podcast on this recently. It was interesting. I did some research on this. One aspect. Oh, wait, so we ignore one and go to the other. One aspect of this bit of this bill that's interesting is that it doesn't apply to preschools. So if you run a preschool or a nursery school or kindergarten, you do you can't exclude transgender people from the bathroom. All other institutions, it does not apply. Um, there's also instances whether there's um, sufficient religious liberty protections, which I have to, I'm still digging through myself. But, you know, this is an actual issue, and uh, uh, we'll have to deal with it. All right, so, heads up, let's see, where we go? I'm going to start in the back, and I'll move forward. So, Steve, go. <laughs> I just have a real brief comment, and I've thought of this, but I thought it would be part of the rewriting book. And one is the violence of the law. So, here. What do you mean, alienage? Not an absolutely, absolutely immutable 
we have a man biologically born a man voluntarily became a woman. So it's like I can be I can be the next kill and kill and like Viva America and Viva America. So one of the aspects of why certain classifications can seem suspect or quasi-suspect was that they were deemed immutable. That is, you were born black. You were born a woman, and you could not change that. One of the difficult aspects of uh, transgender people is that uh, the status they identify as indeed not immutable, it's fluid by design. Uh, the Supreme Court's decision in Obergefell, which specifically avoided the question of scrutiny, dodged that question as well of whether sexual orientation is an immutable characteristic. Um, and the court has basically hinted that there's no difference between status and conduct. That is, if a person claims he's gay or engages in gay sex, there's no meaningful difference. So the court's been moving away from this immutable characteristics. And that, the decision you referenced, the, uh, the Plyer v. Doe, I think that was Brennan also, and he held that um, Texas cannot deny uh, non-citizens access to public schools. Okay, next, who is, uh, yeah. Yeah, go for it. Uh, when I heard it on the radio the first time, probably about four months ago, I thought it was a hoax. And uh, it's shocking to me. I mean, it really is. It uh, makes me kind of question, where, what are we doing? Like, where's our society going? Where are you even entertaining these kind of laws? Not to be on, not to care about these uh, people who are in that position, but it's so subjective of a, of, if, there, if there was a standard where you could, you know, scan someone and said, yes, they, they truly believe this or no, they don't. But it's so easy to go into these situations. Uh, you know, I don't want my obviously my wife being in the bathroom or someone who claims to be that and leaning under the stall or doing something. It's too easy for that to happen. There's no way to prevent it. I think it's crazy to entertain a, a law like that. I, I don't know what we're doing even entertaining stuff like that. It's my opinion. All right. Well, stick like your hand up, I think. Or no, well, I, I was going to. Yeah, okay. I was actually going to make a comment before you did about the fact that if you ran a preschool or what is it? Under the age of those were exempt from the law. That was right. a very one. curious carve out. <laughs> right. I, I, there's, there's no legislative history for the council, but I've been researching this issue personally. But and, and I was going to make that comment. And then to if they were going to disallow that, then any public restroom that allows the possibility of anybody under the age of six or whatever to even possibly go in there, then okay, that should be exempted from the law also. So well, to be equal. Yeah. <coughs> Well, I think the reason why it's not is because I think they might have seen that a parent is going to the bathroom. Like, most parents are going to let their six year old go to a bathroom and let their son watch the thing. So it's like maybe like the parent takes the phone to see the thing. I think it hangs up for a while, sorry. Well, I, I just don't understand why. I mean, we're talking about the rights of the, the transgender individual, I mean, in comparison to the straight individual. But why are we. Cisgender. I'm oh, sorry. So, so the <laughs> so so uh, the, the a person who's transgender, a person who has gender identity, cisgender means they do not identify as a gender with the So, you give a couple of lessons, yeah. Thank you. So, I don't understand why the argument is not written because I think if any one person is one, is that not worth more? Than right, right. Okay. So, this is the issue I think I was talking to Roy before, right? So, on the one hand, you have the stigma of the person who is being uh, uh, told to go to a bathroom that they do not identify and do not feel comfortable in, right? On the other hand, you have the concerns of people who don't want to explain to their children this issue, right? And in the constitutional order, generally speaking, the person being excluded wins, not the person being made uncomfortable. What about the law for your safety? I mean, I would not feel comfortable having to make this gender, transgender, whatever. Why? And going to the restaurant, you can still feel like that. Does that make you dangerous? Yeah. Well, or the person. <laughs> is, that, no, no. <laughs> is, that, is that not based on the gender stereotypes? And I'm not saying this to be me, and I'm not saying it to you, but, but I'm, I'm being mostly dealt that I have more hands than time. Oh, boy. <laughs> okay, okay. I understand that you can't have a female who is identified as a male, and she's going to, you know, restroom. You know, I mean, it, it, it also comes to the for her. Okay, let's, all right, let's start with that. I think my biggest concern about it is if you let these people that identify as men <coughs> that they're not born with, then it opens up a floodgate for people that. And 
say, well, we have to ask. And they're not really feeling that way. And then it just seems like it'll cause bigger issues. So, well, first, I think everyone knows at this point that the ordinance is not just for profession. There's right. a lot of issues with um, individuals who may identify as transgender um, being fired from their jobs, and there's a whole list of things. And there's also an issue if we're talking about this whole notion of pedophiles or whatever. Um, there are instances of children going into male bathrooms and being harmed or abused by a man. And so to go back to this notion of the fear that someone who is transgender, a lot of, I actually sat in one of these um, councils, yes, meetings. And a lot of individuals who were transgender had altercations because they were required to go, for example, a trans woman. So a man who transitioned into a woman went into a male bathroom that was a man because presenting he she is a woman. But she went to a male bathroom, was attacked based on so it could go both ways. If we're saying that we fear transgenders going into a woman's bathroom and could potentially harm someone, a lot of these issues came out because they were actually the ones being harmed. Sarah, um, why can't we? What about the equal protection for the cisgender? Why can't I go into a ladies' restroom if I want to? If that law is passed, why do they get special treatment and I don't? <clears throat> well, I mean, the issue—the so issue, the issue is how things. is how you identify. But um, <laughs> I identify for five minutes that I want to be a woman. Right. <laughs> this, 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 this is a concern. So um, per perhaps one way this could actually be be, be, be kind of thinking about is um, people who transition actually legitimately have their gender changed. They actually go to the DMV, they got their license changed. So maybe one's doing this if you're, then you're checking people's ID at the bathroom door. It's just, family rooms, so <laughs> but what's interesting about the family rooms is there are actually cases like this and transgender people say, we don't want to use that. That's not who we are. Oh, well. Janine? So, I'm listening to all the different uh, comments and you, yeah. what, I, what I've read and um, different things. and. My old soul is going back to the time of segregation, where we we're on race. Similar arg arguments we made for an African American not using a white restaurant, and so instead of separating things on race, we're now separating things on gender or new identifying gender. Mm. And I wonder, are we going to end up with the same path where we're just Unisex bathrooms where it is one or the other, and, and not this segregation of well, now well, first we were segregating based on race, now we're segregating based on sex. What's the difference? And is there really a difference? And the arguments seem to be the exact same or very similar um, to those uh, made century, you know, decades ago um, for excluding blacks from the whites restaurant. Um, the same dangers, the same fears, the same concerns, the same generalizations um, are very similar. And I just see a pattern um, in that. And I just wonder if does anyone else see it that way? Does anyone else see? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and hit everyone, and I'll say something. So Michelle, you're up next. Okay. Actually, I'll, I'll get back to you in a second. Continue, yeah. I, I actually don't think this is about people being afraid of transgender people. I don't think anyone's made that argument. I think what the argument is out there is that um, that the concern is that there'll be pedophiles who would take advantage of this law, where they could dress up as a woman and go into now a woman's bathroom and be able to. Um, um, dress up. Right, no, they, they're, no, they would take they would take hostage of a law that allows them now more access to children. Michael, um, the DMV argument is interesting because the law is actually pressing upon private businesses something that the government itself won't recognize. If this same person went to the DMV and wanted to change his driver's license to say I identify as female and was wearing a wig and makeup, they wouldn't allow that. Need any proof? And so. The government is now pressing or allowing a law yeah. or statute that they don't hold themselves to. Yeah. Yeah. Well, to 
me, I don't know if it's just like a cultural thing, is that I was born and raised in the Philippines. So, like, I don't really see that it as that big of a deal. Because in the Philippines, like, that's the norm. Like, yeah, you have like men over the restroom, but it does occasionally happen where because the lines were long, a man will go into the women's restroom. And I have done that myself. Did you send her? I've got I've used the next restroom before because I'm sorry ladies, it would take too long. Honestly, like the men's restroom are much nicer in some cases. So I will I will like use it if there's such a long line, which I have to keep. I'm not gonna get a UTI. Oh this class. Honestly, look rescue us, please. No 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 UTI, please. I'll actually rescue you and I'll take a much broader macro level. Okay. To me, and maybe I'm just missing this, to me, it's, it, this is the bathroom day of loving. But when you go back to guys like like John Stuart Mill, right, who talks about in on liberty, the danger, right, of the tyranny of the majority. Mm -hmm. That is what this is about. Right? He talks about the Tocqueville talk about it. talked about it back then. This concept of one group defining what it is, whether it's loving and white people. Can't marry women or bathrooms. Someone's defining what normal is, mm -hmm. and that's a danger to liberty. To me, I'm just saying mm -hmm. that's the he called it the second danger to liberty. But in essence, if the majority can define what's normal, then what's the purpose of the Constitution? I mean, what I mean, why do we have this 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 concept if not to protect the minority, mm, to mm. protect the excluded, to protect the whomever. So, so I, I'm going to get you guys in a minute, but That's Oslo made a very good point that I want to dwell on for a minute. Uh, very, very well said. He cited Locke, de Tocqueville, and Mill, which is, which is three for three in my book. So um, there was a mention in your notes about uh, a case called uh, United States versus Caroline Products. It was mentioned all the way at the end, right, which most of you probably never even got to. But... This is an important decision for a lot of reasons. So the facts of this case um, weren't very important. The facts of the case were like this. We'll talk about it later. Um, does anyone know what compressed condensed milk is? Like, like uh, what was it um, uh, pink car carnation, right? Right. It's basically you take the parts of the milk, you extract the dairy, and you dairy, and you you have to buy milk every day. Or you can just put on your can on your shelf these compressed canned milks. It saves a lot of money. So what do you think the dairy farmers did? They got it banned. They got states and the federal government to basically criminalize the transportation of this condensed milk. Okay. That's not important. But in the decision, there was a footnote, footnote four of Caroline Products. This is the most important footnote in the history of constitutional law. If they want to ask you footnote four of Caroline Products, you will know what this is. And the court makes effectively the point that Onslow makes. It said, listen, usually courts are very deferential to the majority, usually, except when a law affects, quote, discrete and insular minorities, <clears throat> that generally the courts are very deferential to the democratic process, except where the law touches on certain discrete and insular minorities. And these are people who lack access to the political channels to affect their own change. Right? So in most respects, majorities can rule as they see fit, the normal, what Angelo was saying a minute ago. But if the law touches these discrete and minorities, whether they're blacks or perhaps gays or whatever, right? in those cases, the court applies a more heightened scrutiny. Right? That is basically the basis of strict scrutiny. That's, I mean, core monster for sure. But the idea of where racial classifications come from or gender classifications come from is people who are at a disadvantage get more judicial oomph if you will, whereas age, not really so much. So, so in many respects, 20th century constitutional law um, embodies the principles that Onslow was discussing about. It's a very nation that, that certain minorities that lack the political challenge, and indeed, this is a plebiscite, right? We are, uh, we Houston, we're voting on the repeal of this ordinance. There are commercials on the radio nonstop about this ordinance and this repeal. And there's significant amounts of money invested on both sides, frankly, of this legislative uh, debate. Um, and, and I don't know, Mark asked me about the political process. I've actually mused to myself whether if this is actually repeal, 
that various LGBT groups sue, saying it violates political process theory. Although after shooting, I don't think it's a very good argument, but, but I, I've been thinking about this one for about a year now, since I knew this was coming up. All right. Anyone else want to talk about this? This was a good discussion. I, I, I think we all had a respectful discourse. Anyone else want anything to add? Hill? And then Jennifer? I just have a question that kind of brings it back to, to the set. Oh, ah, that's where we want to go. Yes, yeah, so, so go for it. Yeah. Uh, well, so. Let's go to Justice the, Rehnquist, the yeah. The fluid nature of gender identity today, and especially I think it, it's becoming more and more fluid um, in the sense that it, it's acceptable to to go back and forth multiple times, not not just the once, right? Um, at least that seems to be a trend um, today. That I think points out one of the issues that Rehnquist takes with this, which is that the standards put forth by, by Brennan, like, they don't, they don't say anything. They, who decides what substantially related is? Who decides what the important interest is? OK, the answer to both of those is Justice Brennan, right? So effectively, by putting this word substantial in there and putting this word important in there, it gives the court a foothold to decide to say, no, 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 your objective is not important enough. It's just like, you know, meh objective, right? Or, you know, there's a fit between what you're doing, but it's not substantial enough, right? <coughs> the entire idea of, and this is Justice Rehnquist's dissent, the entire idea of this intermediate middle tier scrutiny is giving the court a foothold, short of race, short of the evil, evil, evil race discrimination, to also find laws of the state valid. Okay, and indeed, that's exactly what happened in the BMI case, the United States of Virginia. Anyone else, Jennifer? I don't want to cut over you. Did you have a point? You sure? I have one other point. Okay. Uh, one solution I think that could be reached if it is passed is you'll have the individual bathrooms, you know, not marked or anything. Those are not considered a, an accommodation, so separate. If, but if they're available to male or female, and that's all you have. No, so there was actually, uh, I'll get to the second. There was actually a case that was decided, it was in uh, Johnson, Pennsylvania, the judge I clerked for wrote this decision. And you had a student, um, a transgender student, who was asked to use one of these single stall bathrooms um, uh, for some, I think some sort of sports team, I can't remember what team. And the student refused, saying that this, this, this makes me separate, right? You know, like separate. I mean, if you didn't have the band. No, they did, they did have separate locker rooms, and the student wanted to use the one that I can't remember if it was he or she identified with. And the student sued, and that's currently on appeal. And Aquanda? Interesting, and by the way, early voting is going on right now, um, and I hope all of you vote. You're intelligent, informed citizens. You should all vote. If you're not registered, oh, you, Lord help you, but you should all be registered. Vote. <laughs> yeah, Lee, last comment, we'll move on. Oh, beautiful. Yeah. Let's do it. So let's talk, where the heck were we up to? Oh man, who? Taylor, Taylor, bring us home. What What were the facts of the VMI case? What What? What? what, what was the um, Virginia Military Institute's policy? Um, they were a single sex couple. Okay, good. And why did they say they had uh, this, this men only uh, admission policy? Um, because it, it functioned to train men for leadership positions, but I think it was because they said that the females could handle the rigorous activity. Okay, good. So we have here uh, Virginia Military Institute. Anyone ever heard of VMI? Anyone ever heard of it? It's a very, very prestigious school in Virginia. I mean, it's been around since like the 1850s. I think it predates the Civil War. Um, and it was meant to train these cadets, these skulls of mush. Come in there, got my jar heads up here, right? Bring, bring, bring these guys into basic training and train them to be uh, officers, train them to be 
you know, the, 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 these warriors, right? And the method they use, and maybe if any of you guys were in um, boot camp can tell us, is this adversative method. Daryl, did you go through something like this? Sorry, Marine. Want to tell us about it? Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> boot camp three months of zero private. It's basically the equivalent of being probably in prison. You yeah. get everything together. There's no privacy. There's no uh, humanity. They strip you down and rebuild. Yeah, Steve, um, same, same experience? Yeah. You had boot camp there? Yeah, uh, same? Ah, uh, it's a grunt, right? Everyone's so, equal. So, yeah, so I mean, the schools had this educational method, okay? And then you have a female who applies to the school, and of course, she is not given admission because they don't admit women. Okay, and this goes to Supreme Court. And Bridget, what does Justice Ginsburg say for the majority? Um, are you talking about the separate school? Yeah. Is it is it lawful? I'm sorry. What constitutional framework do we apply to consider the admission policy here? The equal protection. Okay. And what 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 what's our classification based on here? What's our class? Women. Gender. gender, gender, right? What scrutiny do we apply traditionally for a gender-based discrimination? Until that case, we didn't have one. Well, but the year 1996 now, so what, what do we do in 1997? Oh, the intermediate. Right. We have a quasi-suspect class here, gender. And under the court's holding, we apply intermediate scrutiny. So we have to ask here the two questions, right? Uh, 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 so, Tam, question number one, what is the state's interest in um, uh, running VMI? What's their interest here? The interest is to train the um, people who are to be a leader. Right. It's this idea of, of training these citizen soldiers to be these like ultimate warriors and they can go on and conquer and you know do these awesome things and then be replaced by drones in a couple of years, right? So Tam, uh, is this is this interest to use Justice Brennan's word important? No. It's not just substantially related. No, I, I didn't get to the fit. Okay. Is this interest important? Yeah, I think I think the answer here is yes, right? Um, the state has been running the school for almost a hundred years. Um, uh, you know, they, they produce these 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 citizen soldiers, right? But uh, Daryl, does the state have an interest in pursuing this goal at the cost of excluding women? In other words, could the state achieve this goal? By including women into the into the project, they they don't think so. But yeah, they could. Okay, so Virginia says we could not obtain <coughs> this important governmental interest if women are admitted. So, Dara, why does the state say that if women were admitted, they cannot achieve this goal? Was the uh, adversative method they their you know, absence of privacy the the absence of the Quality of treatment, and they're saying maybe one of you wouldn't fit. But we'll give an alternative. You know, yeah. we'll, give a, we'll give another one. We'll put the women's equal to separate. Okay. Equal. By the way, I have zero viewers there. Earl, Earl's back. He dropped off. I'll come back for a minute, right? <laughs> hey, Earl, how you doing? So, yeah, so that, Daryl's right. The school says like this We could not achieve this goal of the warrior citizen by having a gender, uh, you know, a, a, a gender mixed classroom um there no, there's no privacy in our program um you know we wouldn't we'd have to create all these new accommodations and also they say that they don't think women would be able to complete the rigorous training okay so we agree that this is substantial uh, an important governmental an important governmental interest right uh, nina does the court think though that this this interest is substantially related enough to having uh, and a classification based on gender. No, why not? Um, essentially, because it's it's um I mean okay, 
Okay, so the fact that someone is interested and they can. Yeah, keep going, keep going. You're on right, right track. That a woman is interested in, in applying and attending. Yeah. They have the capacity to do so. They should not be prevented from. Good. Um, okay. Exactly right. Thank you. So Justice Ginsburg basically says this in the majority. The mere fact that the school thinks women will fail does not mean that women will fail. The mere fact that there's speculation that women won't be able to handle the, um, the, the aversative method doesn't mean they won't. And what Justice Ginsburg suggests and kind of hints at is that this is based on the, some sort of stereotypes that women are weaker. And they're not able to withstand the same sort of rigorous training that men are. The same sort of stereotype that made the people in Oklahoma think that these genteel girls can have beer, but these you know rowdy boys can't, makes the people in Virginia think that you know these rigorous boys can handle this training, but these genteel girls can't, and they should go somewhere else to school. So Justice Ginsburg makes the test a little bit more difficult. And the point where she says that Justice Scalia got mad at was she said the, the, um, the justification must be, quote, exceedingly persuasive. The justification must be exceedingly persuasive. So it's not enough that it has to be important. Ginsburg basically adds on to it and says it has to be exceedingly persuasive. So we have a made-up test that's built up to another even harder made-up test to satisfy. Okay. Um, Ginsburg also says that you can't have a justification based on hypotheticals, right? You can't make up reasons after the fact why women are excluded. There have to actually be real reasons why this happens. Okay. Everyone okay with that so far? Marcella, um, let me ask this question. What about uh, Mary Baldwin College? This was a, uh, an all-girls school. Uh, not too far away in Virginia, that they made their own uh, what's called the Virginia Women in Super Leadership, VWIL, right? Was this a sufficient workaround to achieve the goal of having female citizen warriors, like Xena or something? I don't know. <laughs> asking if it was this alternative school sufficient <laughs> an alternative means to accomplish the same goal of having citizen warrior female super leaders? Got it. Oh, we'll come back. Okay. Well, I guess. Well, what's the holding? Is that is that a sufficient alternative? The Virginia, the the, the, the the girls' college. No. Why not? Because it's still it's changing or it's making something suitable for them. Right. It would not be the same exact program by definition. It's on a different campus. It's a different program. <clears throat> Okay, so this was a very significant case. The court basically, this is Justice Ginsburg's like peace dealer's result. This is like her major case. And the court held here that even a goal as important as creating citizen soldiers is not substantially related enough to having a classification based on gender. That the school would be able to obtain the same sort of citizen soldiers with having a, 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 a dual gender admission policy. Okay. Any questions in the majority? So does anyone know why Justice Thomas dis, uh, didn't vote? He recused. You want to take a guess? Someone. It's someone to VMI. So Justice Thomas is someone to, so Justice Thomas recused. Okay. So let's talk about Justice Scalia's dissent for a minute. He dissented alone. Even Justice Rehnquist concurred on, on fairly narrow grounds. Uh, Tim, up top, what was the thrust of Justice Scalia's dissent? Uh, he's basically really ticked off. About <laughs> yeah, he's ticked off. Yeah. He, you can tell when Scalia is ticked off. When he's running by himself, he is pissed. Yeah, yeah he was real mad because of Ginsburg's tightening the intermediate scrutiny test. And he said, hey, it's basically the same as the strict scrutiny test. Right. Now. So Scalia first says the court has basically either watered down strict scrutiny or improperly elevated intermediate scrutiny. So there's no difference. And specifically, he argues that the court has made it impossible to have any sort of single sex education. Okay? He said he's made it impossible, right? 
if you can't have a single sex public education for like boot camp where they throw you through the mud and they, they don't give you a bathroom, then can you imagine having classes that are single sex education for public school? Can you even fathom that? This makes the experiment at Berkeley seem even more absurd, right? If, if, if you, you can't have single sex, edu uh, single sex education for the sort of, um, you know, training and all this rigorous stuff, uh, how can you possibly ever for law school, okay? Um, Scalia says he has no problems with the tiers of scrutiny, which he probably doesn't believe in. Um, but if you're going to have levels, you should stick with them. You shouldn't just um, tweak them and massage them whenever it's convenient for the outcome of the case. Mm. And also, he says that we should have a lot more deference for the state, especially in matters affecting national security or, or things like this. Okay. Any question on the Scalia descent? He's pretty ticked off here, you can tell. So, um, uh, Michael, let me ask this question. You're a college football fan? All right, so the UT Longhorns, right? State school, right? What if a girl applies to be quarterback? She walks on and says, Coach, I want to try out. Let's say she can throw it. Could the coach of this team categorically say, you are not eligible to be a player on the UT football team? What was that? I think she'd go to Baylor. She'd go to Baylor. Why? <laughs> Baylor is ranked pretty good. No, but I'm asking – Right? So we say here, at a state college, they cannot exclude people on the basis of gender. So, Michael, I'm asking you, constitutionally, could a college football team, D1, categorically exclude women from the team, consistent with the Constitution? Yeah, I mean, if you can't have a reason why to exclude women from a university that's based on this boot camp regime, then, you know, college football ain't that important. Maybe, maybe, maybe in Texas, college football is as important as national security, right? <laughs> but this is actually mentioned in a note after a case I substituted UT for Ohio State. Uh, one, you know, they're actually ranked to Ohio State. So um, uh, the, the question becomes, though, you know, how, how far do we want to push this? Now, we're talking here about whether Houston should enact an ordinance to allow transgender people to use bathrooms. What if a transgender person brought a lawsuit under the Equal Protection Clause saying, you're, you're barring me from the bathroom I want to go to. You're violating protection. Or you're violating the Civil Rights Act. See, that's what's interesting. Not whether we can enact this democratically, but whether a lawsuit would actually succeed saying that depriving a person. Now, the case I mentioned, the one from Pennsylvania with the, 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 the athlete, this person brought a constitutional claim. And there's a question of whether the Equal Protection Clause guarantees a person this sort of guidance, and they can use whatever bathroom they choose. So it's very likely that while we're debating this in a, in a democratic context, at some point, a court will so hold that it's mandatory to give a person a bathroom of their choice and remove that decision from the, uh, from the uh, public square. That will happen eh, in the next 10 years or so, maybe, maybe sooner, I don't know. Of course you can. Is it illegal to use the other gender restroom? Because I, I'm with her. There's a line, and I'm not going to, I'm going to wait I've gone in the men's restroom. Um, I don't know. I actually, I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. There was an arrest in Houston for a woman going to men's restroom. Well, okay. So actually, actually, no, I, I do know. So if you go into, I think the way, the way the law is played is if you go into a bathroom of the opposite gender for purpose of doing something bad, it's a crime. Because very often a father will take his daughter into the men's room and vice versa. That that happens <clears throat> often enough. I think the, the way the law is crafted, there has to be a mens rea requirement and intent to do something other than peeing. So, yeah. respectfully. I, want, I actually once went to, um, uh, to Taylor Swift, I once went to a Taylor Swift concert at Heinz Field in, um, in Pittsburgh. And this is a stadium that's meant for thousands and thousands of men, but basically old women and me. So, like, the line in the, in the, the ladies' room were out the door, and the men's room was like, you know, there was no line at all. It was like, awesome, right? Yeah. And they actually converted some of the men's rooms into ladies' rooms. There were so many girls at the Taylor Swift concert. I know that's what you want to hear tonight. All right. One last question. I'll start wrap it up. I have a question. Also. Yeah, last question, and we'll wrap it up. Um, so, under rational basis, basically, the government could lie. Make up anything you Yes, and we'll get there in a while. Under the rational basis test, the government can lie, they can make stuff up, 
Under the rational basis, they go, Your Honor, may it please the court, the defense rests. They don't even need to give an answer. The government can make, the court can make an answer up for them. There's a case called Williamson v. Lee Optical. Uh, Williamson v. Lee Optical. We'll talk about that later for protection. Um, but effectively, that case held that under the rational basis test, the government can make up any rationale they want. So let's, let's, let's summarize. At, on page 1442, if you go to 1442, there's a very good summary of the entire unit. Uh, surprisingly good summary. The book doesn't do stuff that's helpful for you. This one actually is helpful. And it walks through virtually every single case we've had in this unit. And I'll, I'll walk you through somewhat quickly. So we started with Slaughterhouse, right, where the court basically read privileged immunities very narrowly. We had Brattle v. Illinois. This was the lawyer case where they said uh, women have no place being attorneys. And then we had Minor versus Happersett. This is the case where they said the 14th Amendment doesn't protect women. Okay. It wasn't until the 1970s that that case was reversed, more or less. So in terms of race, we have Stroud v. West Virginia, right? That was the case that said you can't have a law excluding blacks from jury service. We had the civil rights cases. This was recalled the case that said Congress cannot prohibit discrimination in place of public accommodation under the Section 5 powers. Uh, we have Plessy, of course, which is a separate but equal doctrine. Uh, we had Cumming versus Board of Ed which discusses that uh, uh, you know, the, the, the courts will not force the opening of a black high school. Um, Giles v. Harris, this was of course the case that said uh, they will not force a black person to go onto a crooked voter registration system. Uh, Brea College versus Kentucky, um, this was a case where they said that they'll uh, uh, criminalize interracial education. Then we fast forward to Brown v. Board in 1954, which prohibited racial uh, discrimination in schools. Uh, Loving versus Virginia, which got rid of the uh, anti-miscegenation laws. And then we have Grutter v. Bollinger, which said that diversity and the benefits therefrom are compelling interests. Uh, in terms of sex, we have Craig v. Boren. Uh, we have Virginia v. U.S. And these cases sketch out the flesh of the protection clause in terms of uh, strict scrutiny, intermediate scrutiny, and rational basis scrutiny. <sighs> Any questions? All right. Go vote, everyone. Have a good day.